Welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Mike DeHaan and Dan Austin. From wins, losses, horror stories, and tactics for optimizing your business, Mike and Dan take a real, uncensored deep dive into the ins and outs of running a full-time real estate investment and wholesaling business. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 42 of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Ooh. Investing Podcast. 42. We're, we're 10 away oh. from a full year, from 52 episodes worth. That's uh, that's pretty Dang. good. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I feel cool. like we're, we're that's like a 1% podcast thing just to make it to, <laughs> make it to one 52 year. weeks, 52 episodes. Honestly. Yeah. Well, I, I think the statistic they say is like 90% of podcasts that start never make more than 10 episodes. Um, or like never oh, make it shit. we're in top 10%. Yeah. Welcome back. Collecting keys, a top 10% podcast worldwide <laughs> in terms of episodes and nothing else. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting last little bit here. It, it, this business, man, like the stories you get from sellers and like these transactions, like you just can't the stories, make the up. stories of legends. It, it is like, it, it's like nonsensical. Like it sounds <laughs> like a, a silly movie, like half the things that happen. Like, you know, you think of these ridiculous situations that happen in like early two thousands comedy movies, you know, that's like the kind of stuff that happens. <laughs> all the time. You can't make it up. And it's just like, you sit around, like you could just, sometimes I do this too. I just like think about sellers and like their face pops in my head or like the story or like, a picture that I see of a seller in one of James' photos like pops in my head and then the story comes to me and I just laugh. I'm like, <laughs> so like the base the baseball bat I have in the background here, right? Yeah. I right. mean, that's a great seller story. I mean, this is seller junk, right? And like yeah. that you, whole property, that whole situation is so weird. But that was like an average story. I know. Yeah. If yeah, if you go you go check out check out this video on, on YouTube, we have this baseball bat that Dan has propped up on the wall behind him. <laughs> James's it has, name. It has James's it. name burned into it, which was left <laughs> for us sale, by our sales sellers. Our act manager. Yeah, yeah. James our act manager. Have from our, our the well, seller this like, is why they didn't like him, I guess, and burned his name into a baseball bat because it was for him and left it in the garage. <laughs> I, I don't know. They they did some weird shit, but like the just the whole story of them. I mean, this was a crappy, crappy house. Yeah. I had no idea that the seller lived across the street. Oh, yeah. You're right. No idea. The tenant that, that carved the baseball bat that burned, burned the name into it. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm like, this house was junk and trash and like the whole neighborhood did not like it. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, it was just sitting there. I mean, there's the whole front yard, the whole backyard. And then the seller was across the street. All she had to do is walk over there and tell them to pick up their shit. She, I didn't know she owned it. And yeah. then like them packing it all in an RV and, um, and they still had so much crap there and poop, yeah. the whole basement was filled with poop. So yeah. weird. Yeah. Yeah. That, That's like yeah. an average story though. That was yeah, classic, classic hoarder house. But, um, the current one though. So we had this letter that went out and this person calls in at one thirty in the morning which, you know, sounds weird, but like, it is kind of weird, but also, I mean, I don't know, we market to a lot of crackheads. So people, you know, they're on their own time. They've been sleeping all day coming mm -hmm. off of their high mm -hmm. and decide to call us at one thirty in the morning. Um, but the person that was on the phone was su like surprisingly like, up, like high energy, like upbeat, like very sort of put together sounding. So it was a really strange sort of call. And we were trying to figure out, are they like in Europe? Or are they like overseas somewhere? And it's like morning for them. And they don't understand they're calling us at 1.30 in the morning, which we, we've done deals with people overseas before, like owners um, who live out of the area now and just kept a property here. So we're trying to figure it out, doing some research on the property. And then we're like, well, there's a senior tax exemption on the property. So maybe there's like an older person that lives there and we're dealing with like the kids or something like that. Um, so basically James shows up to this house and there's this older lady there and, you know, comes out and it, we didn't realize that she was, <laughs> laughing. I, I shouldn't laugh. It's kind of messed up, but it, she's like, she was deaf and mute. Right. And so she has like, she's literally unable to communicate in a normal way. So James is having to, um, you know, communicate via message and how this lady was able to call in again, why she chose us at one in the morning. I'm not entirely sure probably because she might be a crackhead. Um, but she like goes uh -huh. through this service, which is actually kind of cool. Basically she gets on zoom. The person calls us 
listens to us, signs back to her, and then she like signs to them. And you know, they see they have a communication over the phone, which is which is which is pretty cool, right? But anyway, like it's super weird. This old lady who can't hear, she can't speak. Squatters have moved into the house against her will and are now cohabitating with her. And it's become a situation where they're all just kind of okay with it. Like she isn't, but she doesn't want to leave and doesn't really know what to do. And I think is also benefiting from their drugs, or at least that's what James said. So she's just kind of like letting them live there and she calls them her guests, but it's just like a constant revolving door of these drug addicts that are coming in and out of this house while this lady owns it and lives there and just like lets that happen. Um, or is like unable to stop that from happening, even though I guess if she called the police and was like, hey, I have these trespassers, if you get them removed, but she doesn't want to do that. Or maybe because she can't freaking call them because she can't speak or do anything. It's just like it's she just can't talk like, to them. She can't, she can't talk, talk to them. Yeah. She can't do anything. We're right? like, Keller here, man. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Like, honestly, though. And so it's like what we're having to do is she's decided that she does want out. So we're buying this house and we're working with the people that use like the zoom system that she works to help her negotiate to buy a mobile home that she wants to move into with the money she's going to be getting. And so there's like this whole culture of like the, the mute and deaf support community that we're now getting involved in to help this lady complete a transaction. So she can escape the, the illegal roommates that have just moved in with her and are now cooking meth in the kitchen. Like, it's just like, I can't wait. I can't wait to give this to our closing agent because she likes she, <laughs> our closing agents deal with some shit. But I cannot wait to see her face when this shows up on her desk and she has to have a Zoom session open with this deaf, mute, maybe a meth or crack addicted seller. Yeah, I think it's more than 50% <laughs> likelihood that she's also using. Um, but like, yeah, it's just such a weird deal, you know? And, and it's like the kind of stuff too you look at, people are like, Know, investors charge too much money for their deals versus realtors, whatever. But like, this is the kind of thing that like 99% of realtors I know for a fact would be like, yeah, I'm not going to deal with this. They, they can't even DocuSign. Yeah. I have to get off the golf course. I'm not going to deal with this yeah. situation. Well, and they, um, we bought it at such a low price that the commission, again, you're right. They're like, no, I don't deal with that. Yeah. Unless I guess you're super thirsty or hungry, but then they also probably, a lot of uh, people that would be that super thirsty are probably newer and don't have the mm-hmm. skill set or tools to work through this type of transaction where there's just so many roadblocks, so many. So many. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, and, and it's a pretty high risk sort of deal as well. I mean, we're having it at a low price, but it's a major fixer upper. Um, you know, we're going to have an unknowing number of squatters you're going to have to deal with. Like it could be two, it could be 10. Like, you know, it's a high likelihood when they know that the property is sold that they just go and just steal everything from the house like the furnace the hot water heater rip all the copper out like all those sort of things it's a high possibility it gets stolen before we sell it yeah sorry it's one of those where you have to do like the the board board shit up type thing um but the other thing i mean we got at such a price point it's almost worth just bulldozing it and then we could build Mm -hmm. a new house on it or new dupe a new duplex yeah if it was in a better neighborhood i'd say so for sure i just don't know if i like that neighborhood for new build stuff people are doing it over there though um yeah, but I mean, I mean yeah people do bulldoze and put a trailer on it <laughs> yeah right it's throw a mold down <laughs> honestly yeah i mean well, right? honestly though now uh, with how the with how the city of spokane has changed and they're allowing you now to um build duplexes everywhere there's probably a lot more value in it than there would have been just a lot three more weeks value. ago yeah, yeah. but yeah. so yeah so we're dealing with that sort of situation right now um and then we have another one which I'm is a screaming deal, but there's so many red flags on this deal. Um, so James, our acquisitions manager, who's local here, has never actually seen the seller, um, which is highly suspect mm. and worrisome to me. Yeah, on this deal, I don't know if you know this yet, Dan, but so he's been working with. Um, this like, is when we got under contract already. Yeah. So he, he's, he's wor- wow. been working with like this other person who is like helping them, but isn't affiliated with the family or the lady that owns it. And James has never actually seen the owner. And when, when the contract got signed, cause the person couldn't do DocuSign, um, he went to the house, met like the contact 
And then the contact's like, oh yeah, I'll get her to go sign it. And like went inside, got it signed, and then like came out with like a signed thing. James has swung by the house yesterday and like hasn't seen the person. Um, So there's some weird stuff going on. This person's dead in a freezer. This person's in a freezer. It might be, like honestly. And I'm like, we're kind of at a point. Well, James said the one one thing that is positive is the handwriting is very distinctly different from what this guy like wrote on some of the things versus the signature. But even then, like, who knows? So, so I made it very clear to James that he needs to go and get, have a conversation with this seller to make sure that we actually know what's going on and that she's actually God. doing this at her own will. Right. Be yeah. Too serious. Yeah. Some bangers. <laughs> <'Cause there's laughs> I love it. <laughs> some serial killer who's trying to like sell the house of the person that he murdered. <laughs> like at least that's oh, what it man. feels like. You know, I'm just like, oh my god. Yeah, it just has so- it has been a hell of a week, just on on every front, right? Like, um, so much baggage. You know, we have we have our um, one flip that we're our last one, our last mm-hmm. bit of inventory. The neighbor has, hates me. She's been calling me over and over and over, like three times a week, um, at least, well, that tell she, me to she, mow the grass. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe you should uh, respect the neighborhood, Dan. Just being such a you know, I, I should. And normally, here's the thing is normally I would. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Normally we try to do that. Like we wouldn't, don't want to be like, it's a nice neighborhood. But um, the issue, like the issue is, it's like, lady, we're pretty sure people are being sex trafficked through this house before and lots of drugs. Mm-hmm. I mean, we found drugs there when we walked, right? Like people were doing drugs. You should be happy. You should be thanking us that we're cleaning up your neighborhood. Instead, she's calling about the lawn being an issue because it's overgrown, which is not like a big lawn. Like you can't see it from the road. Cause like this house sits up high. So mm-hmm. like the only parts that look like crap are like, I think next to her house where the fence, where she can see into the backyard. Yeah. Which is fine. I get it. Um, but anyways, like she called the fire department. She's filed city complaints, which if you know anything about our city, doesn't mean anything. They have no way to find you or they have no, there's nothing they can do. Like mm-hmm. there's nothing they're going to, they're going to do for your grass. They, they don't. Um, but anyways, I guess the positive thing is the firefighter went there because they called the fire department on us. And um, he called, the dude calls me and he's like, hey, just so you know, like the back door here is open at this house. And I was like, oh, yeah. And he's like, oh, by the way, you, you should mow the lawn so the lady stops calling us. I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take care of it. So anyways, they sent our handyman out there. And he's like, yeah, we're going to have to put some padlocks on all these doors because there's like three doors to this house um, because somebody had broken in and taken a shower in the house yeah and i was like what who who does that so i'm wondering <laughs> if it could have been somebody related to the old seller because again right. it's not like not like in a weird neighborhood or a weird area where like homeless people would be walking by but then again i you know the homeless population is crazy right now maybe they're just yeah. everywhere and there's zombies just walking around and see that because it would be really hard other than the fact that it probably looks vacant because <laughs> the lawn looks like shit um but there, you know I, what i mean like it's kind there of was weird. weird weird stuff going on with that house though before we bought like, like mm-hmm. we don't we don't we still don't know what the full situation was but there was like the seller that was living there that had all these subleases with like random people that she refused to give us any information right. on um and was like just a it was a revolving right. door and at one point i think she said more than 60 people have lived in this house over the last couple of years right so i'm like is it you know and, and i asked her i was like is this like a like a women's shelter? Is this like a rehab facility? Like we don't care. We just sort of need to know, especially if it's like, yep. you know, there's been people coming back, like being like, Oh, where'd my, my women's refuge go. And it's like, well, sorry, now it's gone. Yeah. Like this is this yeah. helpful information that would be good. No. And she refused to tell us. So I'm going to assume that it was something highly illegal. Otherwise she would have given us yeah. some level of information. Um, they, yeah, they were doing something shady, something weird. Yeah. I mean, obviously we found, guns and weapons and drugs and all sorts of stuff at this property. I was just <laughs> like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know what you, I mean? If you go on our Instagram, of, we actually have like trash. a little, a little tour that we posted where you can go and see yeah. all the stuff. Yeah. And they were so yeah. spiteful about yeah. it. They left all their, their like this frozen meat in their freezers and unplugged all of them before they moved oh, out. It was so, so bad. Yeah. It was so bad. They yeah. left a big dump in the toilet. They, I mean, they did everything. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they brought garbage to this house. <laughs> Anyhow, that's old news. All that we got over that. We cleaned the house out, all yeah. that sort of stuff. Um, 
and we've we've been sitting on it. We're about to start. I don't know. Are we going to start construction on it like next week? You think? Uh, I think so. Did the guy call you? Our contract rather? No, he didn't call me. So Should we call that might be another story. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyhow. So yeah, we got that all all done. But I'm like, yeah, somebody's breaking in to take a shower. Like what? Oh my god. What what the hell's going on here? You know. So long story short, though, I'm glad I didn't mow the lawn because then um, the firefighter firefighter friend called me and wanted to make an offer on the house. You know, I'm like, he's like, yeah. So my friend went there. He's a firefighter and said that uh, your lawn needs to be mowed and all this. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, man, it looks like you got a screaming deal on this thing. I was like, yes, but that does not mean that the sales price is going to be any different yeah, right. um, than what we're asking for it. Anyhow, I haven't heard back from him. I, got, I should call him, but yeah, you know, so where, where something bad happens, somebody breaks in because your lawn is unmowed because you're being a shitty neighbor mm-hmm. and takes a shower in your house, it brings you an offer on a property before you've even renovated it. Yeah, right. Glass half full. Maybe. Glass maybe. half full. Or, or he's a typical firefighter. He's out there talking talking shit about whatever schemes they're working yeah. on. That seems to be like yeah. that that age Fire. demographic. Firefighters, man. Spend a lot yeah. of time. They're like, dude, that. yeah, I, 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 only, I work like six <laughs> days a month, make 120 grand a year. It's got my side hustle over here. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, good for, good for them, the ones that do it. But there's also yeah. a lot of them that just spend yeah. a lot of time talking. Exactly. Um, just right. kidding, but anyhow, yeah, we, we, did, nothing you know, against they, you firefighters just a stereotype that is always true um but yes yes always true <laughs> you guys are always in great you guys are always in great shape exactly yep Don't walk <laughs> um but uh yeah i mean oh which I, does I, remind I, me i did yeah. i did uh i did hire a, tr- a personal trainer just so in the case the listeners care i did hire um your coach will oh did you really uh, which has been working out great yeah nice yeah how long have you it's working been, with uh, It's been good. He's been pro. Uh, maybe a month now. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. To get, to been get doing in. like a lot of uh, re- rehab stuff on my, my mm-hmm. injuries. And so that's been helpful. He's been programming for me around those sorts of injuries, which is better than what I'm doing. Sweet. So yeah, that's, it's a health goal of mine this year. So. Sweet. Right on. I'll give, I'll give him a plug. Then so we both used them now. So yeah, if you're into fitness and you have yeah. injuries, things like that, I was the same when I started working with them just from my years of beating my body up doing dumb shit um but yeah i work with will trujillo i think his name is from crafted coaching he does remote coaching stuff for his physical trainer uh physical therapist does a lot of rehab work and now does my strength training stuff um yeah check it out if you need a need a coach and reasonably good price for what you get to for all custom it's not like a templated plan oh yeah. yeah yeah no and i chat with him like on every workout like message him like he mm-hmm. messages you back and you can give him stuff and he passes it back and forth and so I, I'm really happy with it. It's definitely been helpful to have so many programming. So like for me, if I have a, you know, I'm just a fitness person in general, but also when you're busy, like programming it is like the worst. It's like eating, like I always like put it together too. It's like the worst part about making dinner is thinking about what to make for dinner. When you guys, when you get your family gets home from work and school, all that, it's not actually eating it. It's just the mm-hmm. thought or making it. It's the thought of actually having to figure out what you want. Yeah. And so when you have somebody programming your meals or programming your, um, parts of your life it's way easier yeah it makes it easier exactly yeah so yeah i mean and and if you're into entrepreneurship or you know anything business related and you're not taking care of yourself then you got to figure that out because honestly it's so much easier to focus and just have more energy when you're not a fat sack of shit Mm. so (laughs) and you have some level of strength and conditioning (laughs) the physical strength and conditioning carries over the mental that's 100 percent sure uh, absolutely anyhow that's a super side tangent but i keep meaning to bring <laughs> that up and tell you that i've been using them so thanks for the ref- thanks yeah. for the referral but hey you know we're we're here to talk about all aspects of life or yeah. just real estate more life, than life business real estate um but uh yeah so we sounds like we finally got an offer on that other cabin that we fixed up so you bought these two little yeah. dinky lake cabins last show me by it was like april maybe it was april march Something like that. Um, yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, one of them we sold. We we renovated and sold pretty quickly um, for like cash offer, no real contingency. This other one took a little bit longer to fix mm-hmm. up just because it was a little bit bigger. We have, um, you know, a little bit more problems with it, and of course, in that process to renovate the second one, the mark started to turn. So we've been kind of yeah. trying to figure it out. But I think you got a cash, cash offer. You said it's a little bit below ask, but yeah. I mean, yeah, right now it, it is. I think we'll, I think I'll negotiate with it, but I mean, this is like to all you haters out there that did not want to buy this deal. Cause we did try to wholesale it. I so know. Our, you know, we were under contract total on it. was like, was it 300 for both of them? We paid, we paid 300 total for the yeah. entire thing. Yeah. yeah. So, 
Uh, yeah, and so we wanted to let it go for like three twenty, and then overall, our basically our our um, total exit on both of them is going to be over five hundred. So it's mm-hmm. like there was plenty of room. I mean, what is that? That's a lot of room, right, between yeah. the two of them. Um, and, and so, but people are like, oh, there's nothing you can do with that. Nothing you can do with that. Well, we had a lot of interest on them mm-hmm. um, and cash offers. Yeah. So I know. And this, this goes back to what we've talked about so many times, this tricky thing with finding buyers on any deal right now. And I, I just, yeah. and like, again, I can't understand it. Like this one, it was very clear. We were at three, 300. We tried to sell them for, I think, 330 is what we were trying to dispo them for. And literally no one even wanted to look at them because they aren't like on the water. And everyone's like, no one wants a lake place that isn't on the water. And I was like, that's what your privileged ass person with money thinks. Yeah. There's tons of people that right. would love to be water adjacent, right? And have a home that's like near yeah. the water that has, you know, deeded lake access, has everything else. You just can't like look out your kitchen window and be on the lake. Yeah. Right. It's, and so it's a it's lake vibe. Be, Everybody likes a lake vibe. Everyone likes a lake vibe. Right. And the, the price has to reflect that. But it was two properties for 330 grand we were asking. No one had any interest. And so now our total sale is going to be over 500 for the two of them. And I mean, the renovation costs across both is probably what, like 60, maybe 70 for between two of them. Yeah. 60, 70,000 probably. And then you got some carry costs in there. But yeah. I mean, say even if you say we're all in, I, I got to run the numbers. Say we're all in a hundred thousand on these things. So we're right? in four hundred. There's still over hundred thousand in profit. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, we have all around four hundred, and we're selling for just over five hundred with all of our sales costs. We should make we should net about seventy five to eighty thousand. Easy. So that means if we'd been able to dispo it for thirty, someone came to the same thing, they would have made fifty to whatever thousand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So and so and people yeah. probably could have renovated us, a lot cheaper than us too. Oh yeah, and that's that's with us doing like our renovations, which is like, Hey, the wiring is kind of screwed up. Should we just hide it in the walls? Like, no, we don't do that stuff. Yeah. We just like, we take care of it. Like we upgraded plumbing, we upgraded electrical, which we could have gotten away with not doing mm-hmm. because these are cabins. Like we did, we had to go a little extra mile on some of the rentals, which cost us time and money. But it's like, that's just how, like, I don't know. I just have a hard time covering things up with paint and caulk when I know it's like a super big like issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so we had to spend an extra thousand bucks rewiring a couple circuits on one of them. Like, who cares? Like, at least I I can go to sleep at night knowing that the seventy five year old lady who bought the one lake cabin from us isn't mm-hmm. going to die by by fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I right. feel better about it. It's okay, <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah, so, and, and I so and, I, I guess the the moral too the moral of the story is like just because your buyers won't buy it doesn't mean you don't have a good deal. Mm-hmm. And we've proven that time and time again on almost all of our flips that uh, we typically like we're not a full-time flipping operation but we will flip opportunistically and or if we know there's still a good deal but buyers just won't buy it and we've paid several hundred thousand dollars this year by doing that yeah i mean easily right and you know also don't be afraid to get your hands dirty if you think it's a good deal because that's another thing that a lot of people will do if they're trying to be a wholesale operation even some of the people in our instant investor group they'll get deals that are pretty good but they're like man i gotta let it go because i can't find a buyer I'm like, no one can find a buyer right now. <laughs> like, right. And that, yeah. And that's Doesn't what, mean it's a bad deal. Yeah. And that's what we've been coaching people on is like, get it at an extra conservative price. And if you can get it, be prepared to close on it. You know, and if you, worst case, you go into it, you start renovating it. And you're like, man, I'm not going to be able to make as much money for it to be worth it. But you're able to turn it into a rental, then do that. Right. And then just wait it out for like a little bit. You know, if you're able to refinance, pull out a good chunk of your money. Um, and just turn it into a rental for a little bit, then you have another exit that you can just wait for a while, yep. you know, because like if it's, if it's, there's a rental, um, if there's a tenant in there and the rent is covering your base on it. Things are kind of weird right now. Things might go down in like the next couple of years, but five, six years from now, that project that you were so pissed off about that has been, been cash flowing for a little bit and has yeah. now gone back up in value and now you've built up some equity yep. and now you're able to sell it and make really good money you're not going to give shit about that one that got got pinned down you know right. i would say the only yeah. caveat being that if it's putting you in a major financial situation um or if it's greatly yeah. affecting your ability to buy more assets um because you're just aggressively trying to grow mm-hmm. then maybe offload it but let's be honest that's not most people most people are looking to do you right. know one to four projects a year you know, they have a chance to recoup their money, um, you know, between their deals, yep. or whatever. But it, unless you're trying to do this as an institutional size business or like a full on business, right? there's really no point in being cut in your losses if you have these, these different strategies. But, yeah. I've, and I think about it right now too, is 
you know, you and I have always talked about having multiple exits. And I think about it right now, for sure, if you're going to be putting properties under contract and you can't sell them, so you decide to take them down, give yourself a minimum two exits. Yeah. Two exits. Like that's all you need. Then, then you, I feel comfortable and safe. So you get under contract, you can't find a buyer. What are your two exits? First is you can still flip it. So you need to have pretty conservative numbers. Mm -hmm. But if you, a lot of times that's still hard to do is it's really hard to get something in a downward market that you feel confident in flipping. But if you can, and you start flipping it, and then you realize you can't get the sales price you want um, on the back end, your option two, your other strategy is just to hold it. And you can still do a refinance. It's not like banks aren't going to refinance you, especially if you already have a previous relationship with a lender and you, they know your business. Mm -hmm. But then you can hold it, even if it's at break, even cash flow after your set-asides. What to your point, Mike, like five or six years from now, you're not going to care. And yeah. I can I can almost assure, assure you with 95% confidence, rents are going to keep going up over the next several years. So maybe you're break even now after set-asides. Next year, you're probably going to be 100 bucks positive. You're after that 200 bucks positive. Like that's just to me where I see and have felt rents going right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and as the affordability keeps getting crazier and crazier for buying houses, that's definitely not going to change. Um, you know, I think rents Absolutely. might start to come down a little bit maybe, but that's not going to stop. Like, like that's primarily going to be in places where there isn't a large tenant base, which I mean, even mm -hmm. here in, in Spokane, if you live somewhere that people are moving, housing housing supply starting to increase but the tenant base is still so incredibly massive and now you know with the supply of houses increasing but the interest rates also going up even if there's more houses available less people are going to be able to buy them because they can afford so much less house than they could have a couple you know a year ago yeah well right? and if you think about it i think we talked about it last week was that um for the first time ever not first time ever for the first time in recent years uh uh, it's more affordable to rent than buy. And that's because interest rates have gone up. Mm -hmm. And if I'm thinking about this, I'm going to start thinking out loud here for a second is that if you, if you look at it, that over the last several years, interest rates have been super low. Mm -hmm. So people have been able to afford more housing, right? Yeah. Typically the people that are still renting during that time are folks that a have really poor credit and just can't get a loan um, or B um, don't have enough down payment, even that 3% FHA down payment. Mm -hmm. um, those are the ones I'm saying are forced to rent. Um, and so what's happened, what's happened during that period of time is everybody in America wants to live the American dream, so to speak, and buy that house. So as people are buying up all this inventory, there's less and less rental stock out there. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's, these millennials are finally getting their first house. They're finally, you know, out of the financial crisis. They're finally able to save up that down payment, buy their first house. Maybe they're stepping up into another house. And at the same time, there's these people that are being forced to rent. And that property that was a rental is now somebody's home. Mm -hmm. And so that's off. Now, now you have decreasing rental units available also at a time where people are coming of age with the Gen Z and the millennials are finally moving out of their parents' basement or whatever the boomers always say about us um, <laughs> are, are moving out, right? They're like, they're, they're expanding their families and all that sort of stuff. And so there's just a lack of supply, which is continuously driving that up. Well, now, now we're at a different point. It's not that people are trying to, are buying off that stock, what it is, is that it's just more affordable to rent mm -hmm. than buy because people can't buy. So that now there's going to be more people on the rental side. So what I'm saying, I guess, long story short, is it really seems like at least in my time, rent rates usually always go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes they can like soften a little bit, but like bad economy where it's more affordable rent, more people are renting. Good economy where interest rates are low, people are buying off that, that rental stock, driving up the demand for rentals. Yep. Yeah, exactly. You can't lose. I mean, the real estate is it, I don't consistency over time with everything. You know, the trends are that every part of it goes up over time. If you look back as long as they've been tracking it, right? So whether that's rental rates, that's housing prices over the, you wait long enough, they will increase in value, which is like most investing. You said houses, most yeah. like a lot of stocks, if you're buying <clears throat> high quality stocks or like that. Um, I think the only thing maybe not is, is cryptocurrency, but even then, that's a whole other ball game. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, and in, in going into these deals as well, one of the things is, is as stuff starts to shift, you know, if you're worried about prices coming down, you're worried about being able to sell properties, those sort of things. We've been doing a lot more creative financing stuff. We actually have two right now yeah. um, that we're buying on. Uh, well, we're, we're, we're buying them with a creative financing in terms of basically a seller wrap. Um, so we're taking over their mortgaging a subject to the seller wrap. So their existing mortgage is staying in place. We're taking over their mortgage. And then in order to get the 
surplus that they need, right? These sellers are, are willing to wait out for a little bit. The surplus that they need for their profit, we're basically having them carry a second mortgage on it, right? Yeah. So for example, on this one I have open right now, their their current mortgage is about 90,000. We're gonna do a second mortgage of about uh, 60,000 to get them to $150,000 total sales price, which is more than we can pay for cash. Um, 0% interest, right, on, on their second mortgage. So all the payment to them is gonna be going to our principal. And then our exit on it, which is going to be pretty interesting. We've never done one of these before. But our, our dispo person over in that market, they have a buyer that is going to buy it from us on another wrap. <laughs> so we're going to see how, how which that is amazing. Goes, which is amazing. So they're basically going to pay us a down payment to secure their spot, which mm -hmm. is where our like major business profit is going to come. And then we are selling it to them on terms um, with a amount that's larger than our total amount of the subject to plus the second mortgage. So we will have monthly cash flow every single month, as well as principal being paid down on the second mortgage on the second note that's ours. Right. And then they're going to have right. basically a five-year balloon, the end buyer will, where they have to refinance us out and we will be able to collect in cash at that point. Um, you know, obviously that down payment will have already got, and then all the principal they've paid down over that, that five years plus all the interest that we've collected that we're charging them for the opportunity to do it. So I think if you look at it, the total, um, let me see if we find the exact numbers on here. It goes from being a deal where there wasn't really anything there. Our total profit, if they exit us in five years, is $119,000 on this deal. That's pretty amazing. On a hundred. I mean, creatively. Purchase. It's a creative deal. Yeah. It's going to take four years to do that. Oh, sorry. Five years to do that. But if it goes out, like that's pretty awesome. If all goes well, I mean, there's a cool. lot of moving and, and, parts. It's pretty complex, but right. you know, it's something we've been, we've been working to learn about. We have a guy on our team that's really sort of skilled at, at crafting these um, different scenarios. And, uh, you know, we have a dispo person in that market who's, skilled at finding individuals who are wanting to buy houses this way. And basically said that the, the key buyer for this is um, culturally Hispanics. They don't have a lot of credit. It's very often, um, it's very common for them to have a lot of cash because they, they don't normally use banks and stuff like that. Quite, quite right. like, like, you know, um, white Americans do. So they're not lendable, right? Like they can't show bank accounts. They don't, can't show credit to a bank. So they can't get mortgages. So what they do is they'll buy, these sort of like seller wraps of these creative deals from investors yep. because it's the only way that they can own a home. Um, right. And, yep. you know, so, so our guy that we're working with over there, he's like, yeah, so typical practical what it goes is, you know, they get into the property over the next five years, they know that they have to save X amount of money to buy you out. And that's what they do. And then they exit and they take pride on He's like, and he's like, I wouldn't exactly. be surprised if it happens yeah. even a little bit earlier. So, um, wow. Well, I mean, it's just such a cool thing too. And why, why everybody's saying, Oh, I, you can't buy right now. You can't buy or they're, they're sitting on the sidelines. This is a strategy to actually continue to buy and continue to grow because everybody knows um, people. Be, this is where you become a millionaire mm -hmm. is when when everybody else is sitting on the sidelines. You're buying. Um, yeah. During these kind of downward downward markets, and and, and it goes back to it reminds me of like Brandon Turner always talking about putting your team in place. Mm -hmm. And I would say we've kind of grown past that piece. Like we, yeah. but like when you think about it, who is our team? We know we need a great dispositions guy. On, on the ground mm -hmm. and we have him mm -hmm. who's kicking ass and he knows how to sell these types of contracts yep. and we needed somebody that could negotiate these with sellers exactly. that could figure these out and so we got that person on the team and mm -hmm. we really truly did build our team or we added to our team we supplemented our team to adapt to the new market yeah for sure and, and the thing is with these creative deals if you look at the profit potential on this right so it's a house that you know Market value, I'm just looking at the notes here again. Market value we have at about 190,000. We're buying it for 150 on this wrap. Okay, so wholesale is not really anything. Flip, there's not really a whole lot of juice there. Um, so it's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar purchase, and our total profit after four years is gonna be a hundred and nineteen thousand dollars. So everyone thinks that you have to do all these ridiculous <laughs> That's such deals. A good... That's ridiculous, right? It's like you think this hundred and ninety thousand dollars, this is what like small time syndicators that are syndicating 12 to 25 unit apartment complexes try to get on their syndications over four years. We're going to get that same profit right. on a $150,000 single family home. Right. And I would say it's but how much do we have out of pocket and money yeah. Our out of pocket zero because we're actually getting paid. Zero? We're getting paid to buy it because we're going to be charging a down payment to our end buyer. 
you know, isn't that cool? And you think about it, you want, you know, someone says they want to be a millionaire. If you can structure had a hundred nineteen thousand dollar property, you can structure ten deals like this. You just made one point two million dollars, right? There you go. Doing ten that's, deals—that's the solution. Ten deals with single family homes. That's all it takes. Wow. Yeah. And no money out of pocket. And no money out of pocket. I mean, money out of pocket for marketing, but like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We ran our business systems right, but as mm -hmm. far as like to acquire the properties, man, that is, I mean, mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm having my own mind blown right now as I think about it as big picture. Like I haven't really right. thought, I haven't yeah. thought about holistic. It's like we, right it's like we well, honestly, like we put all these pieces in place because yeah. we like knew it was like an important pivot we need to make. Like we started doing this a couple months ago, actually mm -hmm. longer than that. Um, but now yeah, you're saying it out loud. I'm like, oh shit, that's that's why I maybe I didn't even think it was gonna be that good. Oh yeah, it's it, it's a good deal, man. Like that's bigger than pursue these. And then like so we have another one in the same market that we're doing this with. And our total profit, I mean, on the bottom, um, total profit at four years is $73,000, right? Wow. So, you know, not quite as sexy as 120, wow. but still that's pretty dang good no. for having no money in the But they deal. balance out. What's that? They balance out, you know, like yeah. 120 plus like 80, it's 200, it's $100,000 a deal. Well, either way, that's, that, that's $200,000 off of two single family homes, yeah. both of which have a... ARV under two hundred thousand dollars. I thought about this the other night while I was laying in bed because yeah. um, that's what I do um, with a one and a half month old at home. <laughs> yeah, um, is uh, maybe I, I would would you sell your house like your primary like this on like a um, wrap like that? Yeah, I think I would. Yeah, because um, I was thinking about it right. So with high interest rate, so I have I'll just full disclosure. I have a two point two five percent interest rate on my home. Mm -hmm. Super low rate, really awesome. Um, my home, my house is worth more than two times the debt, right? So it just, uh, it wouldn't make sense to just do like a sub two to my loan and my loan, my loan is assumable. Um, so I have this like huge stack of equity in there and somebody that's going to be buying my house is probably going to be more of a high net worth person. Um, and will have the down payment, mm -hmm. but they also might be sophisticated enough to understand like, Hey, I can assume his debt at two and a quarter and then pay him say a, uh, a down payment, maybe mm -hmm. a couple hundred thousand dollar down payment. And then me have me carry it. I would even carry it at like, say current interest rates are six. I'd even be willing to carry it at, at five or six, like somewhere there. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't need a premium, but I, so I'm also getting a pretty decent down payment out of them. And then I'm getting my recurring income um, from that equity. But the most important thing to me is then I can offer it at a higher price mm -hmm. because naturally if my house, when I bought it, say it's two and a quarter interest rate, I understand that if I'm selling it at a 6% interest rate, it's likely not going to sell for what it should have sold six months ago, Correct. you know, when rates were lower, right? Mm -hmm. So now I can sell it for what I want to get out of it, yeah. I guess is my point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I pr primary, when you put it on the end there, that because you'd be having to sell it at a lower price than you could have a few months ago, for sure. Um, I mean, in a lower interest rate environment, I wouldn't do that because, you know, if you sell your primary, you live there for two years. It doesn't make sense. It's all tax free, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But I would consider selling pretty much all of my rental properties like that, especially right totally. now. If someone's going to yeah. buy like one of my, if I decide to sell one of my single family rentals and someone wants to buy it, um, but I don't want to pay a shit ton of taxes and they don't want to have a 7% interest rate, say like, hey, I'll give it to you at a 5% interest rate. I know you're willing to pay 400 for it. I'll sell it to you for 450 at 3% and I just need this amount of down payments. That way I can recover some money that I can roll over to something else, but then I'm also not losing my cash flow. Um, and I'm getting yeah. at a higher interest, uh, higher price point at the end of it. So, right. I mean, I think there's, if you're looking to offload properties right now and all yeah. of a sudden you're not getting the offer prices that you want, that's definitely something to explore. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. And especially if you like the mailbox money idea mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily need access to that capital right away. Yeah. I, I know for some of my my personal rentals, that's how I'll probably exit them. Yeah. Like my longer term holds and stuff like that is some sort of seller financing or something. Yeah. What you gotta do is just bundle it, right? So I was actually thinking about this too. Mm -hmm. I was like, I have all of my stuff in Spokane. I was like, what if I just like bundled all of them and sold them for like a small premium, but as like like on terms. So I was just getting like fat mm -hmm. mailbox money without really having to do anything yeah. because I've offloaded all the yeah. risk on it. Um yeah. and it would just be like one singular chunk that came in. And, uh, you know, I lose that on appreciation and stuff like that. But I mean, all my properties I have in Spokane are pretty desirable. So I'll probably explore down the line. Yep. So mm -hmm. anyway, cool guys. Well, this was a, a yeah. show of just catching up with us, all the things we're working on. Obviously we have a lot of different 
opportunities that we're pursuing right now. Um, anything else you want to add, Dan, before we sign off here? No. Yeah. I mean, if you guys want to participate in these opportunities, give us a call, hit us up on Instagram, whatever it is. Um, we love, we're working in several different markets. So yeah. we'd love to partner and do JVs with people, mm -hmm. um, teach you how to do it, whatever. Yeah. You know, we're here. Yeah. We got, we got a lot going on. So we've been, um, doing JVs with people in different markets. So that's something that interests you hit us up on Instagram. I'm at Mike underscore invest. Dan is at investor man, Dan. Um, you can also send us an email at Mike at collect keys podcast.com. If you want to talk about that, if you want to learn how to do this yourself and you want to make big money on your own, um, if you go to the instant investor program.com, it's our group mastermind program. We have been, we've had a couple of our, our folks really starting to get after it. One of our guys on his first batch of mail, he sent out, it sounds like he might get two, maybe three deals just on the first First one they sent. Yeah, I, some really I, I loved his approach. So like, yeah, I love his approach. Yeah, he's already got an appointment. His first call, he got an appointment. His second call, he got a referral because he's also mm -hmm. a realtor. Yeah, so he's ma making some great money. That's amazing. Right out the bat. So instantinvestorprogram.com, go in there and book a call with me. So we see if you're a good fit for it. It's not for everyone. We're mostly looking for people that really want to get after it. So um, a little bit of an application process there, but it's nothing too crazy. Besides that, uh, follow us on Instagram again. I'm Mike underscore Fest. Dan's at Investor Man. Dan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Follow, follow, follow. And uh, <laughs> if you find this podcast valuable, you know anyone that would uh, be interested in it, share it, subscribe it, leave us a five star review. All those things are super helpful. And besides that, thanks everybody. And we will talk to you guys next week. Yeah, see y'all next week. Thanks for listening. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And check us out at collectingkeyspodcast.com for tips and guides on starting your own real estate investment and wholesaling business.